everyone! In this video, I would like to talk about how to find for the underlying form in phonemic analysis. This is one of the most asked questions when I'm tutoring linguistics students. So I would like to give you a quick checklist for all the questions that you have to ask yourself when you're trying to determine the underlying form. Before we get started, let's make sure that we understand what is an underlying form. An underlying form is the form that the native speaker perceives when they are saying a sound. When you're doing phonemic analysis, what happens is that with the same sound that the native speaker perceives, very often they pronounce it in different ways depending on the environment. The underlying form exists in the broader environment, which means you would see a larger variance of sounds if you have all consonants, you would see maybe stops and affricates and fricatives and approximants all at the same time, or maybe you would see um, all kinds of place of articulation at the same time. Or if you have vowels, you would see all kinds of height, all kinds of backness at the same time that goes right before or after your underlying form. The underlying form will be the form that has less restriction. Now, before we start finding for the underlying form, let's make sure that we have all the tools that we need. So we need to list out all the environments of, um, your, of the sounds that you're investigating. I would suggest using a T table to list out all the sounds that go right after and right before the owl phones. After listing out all your environments, we can move on to the checklist. There are three big parts in this checklist. Number one is the distribution of consonants and vowels. The second part is the properties of consonants. And the third part is the properties of the vowels. This checklist provides you all the features that you have to look into when you're trying to find for the underlying form. And I'm going to explain each of them in the slides later. Now let's start with the first one, the distribution of consonants and vowels. The first step is looking at the distribution of the consonants and the vowels. So assuming you have two sounds to, to consider right now, what you have to do is you want to look at the whole column, which means you have to look at the sounds that go right before and right after. So if you have two sounds, you only have two columns to consider. And you want to look at the combinations of consonant and a vowel with the sound that you're investigating. As you can see, I've list out all the possibilities of what can go before and after the sound. There are eight of them. The underline is where your targeted sound would go to. And the eight possibilities are consonant, consonant, consonant vowel, vowel consonant, vowel and a vowel, consonant and a word final, vowel and a word final, a word initial, then a consonant, or a word initial, then a vowel. What you want to do is you want to look at your two columns of sounds and look, ask yourself the question, how many combinations does the sound have? Say if you have two sounds, one of them has five and the other one only has two. Then the one with two is the more restrictive form and the one with five is the broader one, which will be your underlying form. Now, obviously, you are not always that lucky that you can just find out your underlying form in this way. And if that's the case, then we would have to look into um, a more in-depth part. Then we would have to move on to the properties of each sound. Now we will move on to the properties. I put properties of the consonants first, but you can absolutely do the properties of the vowels first as well, especially if you don't have any consonants in your data set, then it's pointless to go through the properties of the consonants. And even if you have both vowels and consonants, um, it is totally a personal preference of whether, whether or not you want to go through one over the other. Um, one of 
the rationale for picking one over the other would be if you are observing your set of data and you are seeing some pattern um, in one of them, say maybe in a vowel, then maybe you will want to go ahead and start with vowels first. But for the sake of explaining the questions that you should ask yourself, I'm going to start with um, explaining the properties of the constants. Now for every single constant, there are three distinctive features. So that is the voice, the voicing, the place of articulation, as well as the manner of articulation. So because voicing is the simplest, you can start with looking at each column of data. Now be careful because we have to look at every single column of sound and we're no longer looking at um, all three sounds together. What you have to do is assuming you have two sounds. Each sound has two columns of sounds that you take from the data. One is the sound that goes right before your allophone, and one is the sound that goes right after. Now, if you're on this step, you have to look at those columns individually instead of grouping them and looking at them three, looking at three sounds all together at the same time. So if you have two sounds, you would have four columns to look at. Now, say, starting from your first column, the first question that you would ask yourself is, are the consonants having the same voicing? If they are having the same voicing, be it voiced or voiceless, that's the time that you want to make a note for yourself because that is the more restrictive environment. Now, if the voicing does not give you a clue, then you would move on to the place. You would ask yourself, are the consonants in the same place or are they at least close by each other? What I mean by close by each other would be things like if you have something that is all alveolar and all palato, or maybe all alveolar and all uvula, or maybe everything has some kind of labio, so labio and labial dental. If you have some kind of similarities like that, mark it down because that is your more restrictive environment. Now, if, if place is still not giving you any clue, then you will look at the manner. Your question for yourself would be, are the consonants in the same manner? Are they all stops only? Are they all nasos? Are they all approximates? Or it could be all stops, affricates, and fricatives. Don't forget that is for the feature minus sonorant. So you might have to look into your features as well. But your ultimate goal is to find for some kind of similarities among um, each of the column. And if all you have in your data set are just consonants, after going through these three questions, you should be able to find for at least one of the sound that is more restrictive, meaning um, that particular allophone would only occur when, say, um, it only occurred right after nasos, or maybe it only occurred right after stops, or maybe right before stops. You should be able to find for some kind of um, restriction in one of the sound. And so the one that does not have that restriction, in the case of just having two sounds, will be your underlying form. Now, obviously, Consonants are not the only thing that we have in languages. We have vowels as well. And the investigation of vowels is pretty much the same as the consonants, except you would have one extra question to ask yourself. Now, again, when you are looking at vowels, you have to look at each column separately instead of looking at all three sounds at the same time. So if you have two sounds, you would have four columns to consider. The first question that you should ask yourself is, are the vowels at the same height? Are they all high, mid, low, or maybe high and mid, or mid and low? Don't forget to take high and mid, or mid and low, in consideration as well, because that is still more restrictive than having all three at the same time. And it is not uncommon for a language to group them together that way. 
If the height is not giving you any clue, then you can move on to backness. You will ask yourself, are the vowels having the same backness? Are they all front vowels? Are they all central vowels? Are they all back vowels? Or maybe front and central, or even central and back. Again, just like the height, it is possible for the vowels to be all front and central at the same time, or all central and back at the same time, and that could still be considered as restrictive. As long as it is not having everything at the same time, that is still that sound is still having some kind of restriction, and you would still want to make a note for yourself. Now, if height and backness are not giving you any help, then you would consider the roundness of the vowel. You would ask yourself the question, are the vowels all rounded or are the vowels all unrounded? If you, can, if you answer yes to any of these questions, then that would be one of the restrictions. Now, finally, if roundness is not even helping you, then you can go ahead and ask yourself, are the vowels all tense or are they all lax? And same thing, if they are all tense or if they are all lax, then that would be your restriction. After going through all these four questions, you should be able to come up with at least one restriction um, among the two sounds that you are investigating. So for the sound that has the restriction, that will not be your underlying form. For the sound that does not have any restriction, um, be it for the column before or after, that will going to be your underlying form because it is less restrictive, which means it's in a broader environment. Here comes the summary of the checklist. The first part that you will look at is the distribution of the consonants and the vowels. There are eight possibilities as far as where the consonant and the vowel, as well as the word final and word initial can go. Don't forget, when you are asking yourself this, the question how many combinations of consonants and vowels there are, you are looking at the sound as a whole, which means you are taking the sound that goes right before and right after olive in consideration. If part one doesn't help you, you would move on to the properties of the consonants and the vowels, which essentially you are looking at the distinctive features of each sound. For consonants, you have to consider the voicing, the place, and the manner. For vowel, you have to consider the height, the backness, as roundness, as well as the tense and lax of the vowel. If you find your underlying form this way, essentially what you have also discovered is what kind of environment triggers the change. So if you have a second question that is, please formulate the root of any changes, then the restrictions that you have found basically would help would help you help you to help you to write um, the underlying form would become this particular phonetic form in the environment of blank, which is what you've you know, what you have found through this checklist that is being more restricted. I hope this video is helpful for all of you who are learning to do phonemic analysis, especially if you're struggling with finding the underlying form. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below and I will try to answer it with my best ability. If you would like to see more um, phonology video, um, particularly with um, phonemic analysis, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and um, perhaps leave me a comment on what kind of topics you would be interested in and I will try my best to see if I can make one. Thank you for watching the video and I will see you soon. Goodbye!